I want to give a nice warm welcome to Tiffany Mertens. Thank you for taking the time out of your very hectic schedule right now. For those of you who don't know much about Tiffany, I want to brag about her amazing background. She got her BA and Master's in Education and Counseling at University of Virginia. She then went to work um, at Colgate for two years, where she was a coordinator of multicultural recruitment and then she went on to join admissions team at MIT. She joined Shorecrest in 2013, and we have been blessed ever since. Um, my personal experience with her, she helped Clayton get into University of Texas in 2014, and now she's in the thick of things with our son Dylan, and we can't wait to have the next five kids come right up to the <laughs> Here's Tiffany Mertens. I am so thankful for the invitation to get out of my office right now. <laughs> um, I'm welcoming this opportunity because I, I think that it's never too early to start the conversation. I'm not a, an army of one. I'm joined by a wonderful um, team of colleagues here. Uh, I am the director uh, of college counseling. Bonnie Carney, uh, over here on this end, um, joined me this year. Uh, local girl from the University, of T worked at the University of Tampa, but went to Northeast High. Really knows St. Pete, love it. And Megan Schneider um, has been here for quite some time. She knows the the school is both a parent as well as a. Um, uh, a colleague and, and a great resource for our students. Um, so, my numbers. I would read for probably about eight hours a day. Wonderful things happen at 5 a.m. So I'd probably get up at 5 a.m. and start reading those applications. Six days a week, so that lucky Sunday was amazing. I learned to multitask. I'd have to watch all of the TV, all of the TV shows on BBR <laughs> while doing my laundry, while cooking for the week, and if my friends could come over and fill me in at the same time, that would be awesome. Um, 18 weeks of the year, so most admissions officers start reading, they start reading right about now, actually, and they don't stop until probably into February, if you will. Um, no social life. My mom was incredibly concerned that I would ever get, if I would ever get married, ever get grandchildren. Um, so hence the life change. Um, and it worked, because I got engaged, so. <laughs> In case you're wondering, like, what is the value of, sh uh, of the Shorecrest experience? I really just have to tell you the numbers. What drew me to college counseling to, to begin with? At the University of Virginia, there was a professor that really understood that, wow, there's a, there's a huge shortage of counselors in the United States. I'm a first generation college, um, uh, college student. My parents did not attend a, a college or university. It was my guidance counselor that helped me get through this process. In the state of California, they have about 700 students to every one guidance counselor. There are some high schools that don't have guidance counselors, right? In the state of Florida, on average, there are about 450 students to every one guidance counselor in this state. Um, recommended by the American um, Counseling Association is about 250. At our local schools, it's about 100 or one in a, a local ID program. For me, I handle 40 or so. And we divide the senior class, with the senior class being my largest senior class that I've had, 84, 42, and 42. So the ability to really get to know your students, I think, is a really powerful tool. Um, and so that's something a little bit, I, I'm going to give you a snippet of what we do and how we do it, what we believe. There's a lot of focus on the name of the college. There's a lot of focus on, like, just get them in, just get them in. And I really focus on getting them through college. My goal as an admissions officer was always to make you an am really amazing alum that I can then brag about in my future information sessions. <laughs> Same thing. I want to make you a very you know, successful uh, Shorkers graduate and make sure that you're going to the place where you can thrive and really come alive. And it may not be the name brand school that you're aware of right now. So it's not just about getting them in, it's about getting them through. We guide, not decide. So I want to make sure that at the end of the day, you know of all of your options. And I'm here to be a, a listening ear. My master's is in counseling education, so I am a listening ear um, to, to help you through the process, but I'm, I'm definitely not here to make the decisions for you. Definitely here to help you support. And then promoting early awareness. My biggest goal at the end of the year is to make sure that I want my families to know. You know, to just be informed and educated. And so that's why I'm so happy to be able to, to talk to you even now. I'll help build your list, help you explore those, those um, schools out there. I'll help you talk about testing and when to test and how to test. 
um, provide tips for visiting college campuses, um, when to visit, and things of that nature. We will read your, you will go through your applications line by line before you hit submit, which is what I'm in the process of, of doing right now. Um, we assist with essays. I read some very quirky ones. I help them get started. Um, I learn all about you guys <laughs> um, in your essays. It's great. Um, uh, we manage recommendations. We, I'm supported by a fantastic faculty and staff that take time to really make sure that they t capture not just your grades, because your grades don't tell the whole story, but, but who are they? What type of learner? Or are they? Um, the, the College Center is also the senior lounge. I get to see them in their element. Like, who are they amongst their peers when no one is watching? Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, advocate on behalf of your students. So one of the last things that I had to do before I, I, I left and, and walked over here would be the University of South Florida is actually visiting on campus right now. Her name is Megan Eastman. And in a chance, before I came over, I just wanted to give her a snapshot on who here are the kids that are very interested in the University of South Florida right now? And you know, they may not read this way, but gosh, wait, wait to, until you meet this young man in person, you're gonna understand how he's a fantastic fit for your cyber security program. So those are the conversations that are happening kind of behind the scenes. We do it in a fun way. So there are a couple of tools that we use. Navion's Family Connection, that's a tool specifically for Shorecrest, by Shorecrest, you, it's, a, it's a data management tool. If you want to know, hey, what is the benchmark that I need to hit to, to achieve the University of Florida? It's real, relevant, real-time information. You're looking at what have they done in the last two years or three years to Shorecrest students. Um, college visits to Shorecrest, as I mentioned, USF is visiting um, um, right now as I, as I stand here. But in this, in, um, in this past week, we've had the University of Florida come in to our, meet our students, about 40 students um, met in this room with the University of Florida representative. UC Berkeley came and sat down on the same day. Emory came and sat on the same day. Um, Georgia Tech. I had six college visits all in one day. We will, we will host over 100 colleges or universities on this campus alone. Um, so they come to us, which is great. Or, or they even use our facilities. Johns Hopkins all, every year will use their, our facilities for their annual Tampa um, presentation. So just to give you an idea of the, the flow that happens through this, through this office a lot. We, we program with the students. So for example, you're looking at a picture of maybe our college fair. Um, uh, we, we have a case studies program where we invite deans of, of admissions to come in in your junior year. This is a program that you participate in. We'll give you mock applications and we will, we will, um, we will, you'll be the admissions committee. You will admit, waitlist, or deny a student. And we give, you will have the application, the complete application, and we invite your families, um, your students in, as well, to participate in a mock application review. So you come in with your notes, a very serious admissions officer, and then we fly in deans of admissions to lead you through the committee just as they would lead their staff. So if you want to hear from them, actually no, grades matter, or actually no, extracurriculars, did you think about this, did you think about that? So we do that in the spring of your junior year. Um, so that happens in January. Um, essay week, it's a blitz in there. And as, as I mean, I, I read a lot of essays, but we meet your students where they are and through some kind of uh, inventive programming, which I'm pretty proud of. This needs to be updated, it will very soon, but this is a snapshot of the class of 2014. This is information that we provide for our, um, for our colleges or universities. Um, the number that I'm most proud of is down here. 100% of seniors accepted to colleges. Like, that's a value of short and I, I know I don't have to sell you on it, but you, you don't even, you may not even understand the value. Because as an admissions officer, I'm saying that even if I take the anchor of the class, the anchor of the class is, you know, my spot towards the bottom of my class. I say, even if I'm looking at the anchor of my class, I, I know that 100% of them are prepared and ready to go. They're ready to go. Versus if I went to an, another school that didn't send 100% of their school, their students to college, middle 50% may not be as prepared and ready to go. So I start to make my cutoff a little bit higher. Right? So another number, this is perhaps my most favorite number, 70% of the applica uh, applications this year for the class of 2015 is 76% um, resulted in acceptances. That means seven out of every 10 applications that left that office, um, left our office in, in, for the class of 2014 came back as an acceptance. You know, so our students have some amazing options, and I'm really super proud about that. But I can't take all of the credit for it. I'm looking at Betty and saying, like, it starts with her! You know, you know, like... So these are some tips that's applicable to through all of the stages that I hope that you can use. But I will also say that I, I break it down by division in a couple of, a couple of slides later, all right? Kind of some things that you've been thinking of. Academic engagement counts. 
So it's not only getting them in that class, that, that, that advanced class, but it's also how they're in, engaging with the information. The buzzword around admissions right now is intellectual curiosity. Are they curious? You know, do they dive in? Do they want to know why and who and what and where? So I encourage you to, to cultivate that curiosity. And what I mean by that is ask a lot of why questions. If there's a chapter that they cover or they go through in school that they can't stop talking about, cool. Google some resources. How can you continue that conversation a little bit further, right? So study your student, if you will. Provide engagement opportunities. So is there, is there a need? There was a chapter on butterflies. Great. Is it, can we get one? <laughs> you know, can we can we you know get a caterpillar and, and, and plant it on a plant? You know, and continue so they can watch it grow and continue and watch the entire process maybe in your living room. Um, but my, my I'm I'm thinking of my sister who did that and you know we couldn't have Thanksgiving because there were three silkworms growing on her on her on her on her, on her, on her table. But my point would be is that. All it takes is that curiosity. So encouraging them to love to learn along the way, right? If they're be receptive and be very um, reflective to, to, hey, there's a chapter, there's something that caught their interest. And the reason why it matters is this, is because if you encourage them to pursue their interests now, right, when it gets to their junior and senior year, they will have had a, this wonderful collection of experiences and exploration. Right? They would have said, oh wow, I, I really love history, so maybe I can join, um, say, Preserve the Bird, you know, a local nonprofit that really needs tour guides, right? <laughs> oh, hey, shout out. <laughs> a local nonprofit that really needs tour guides. You know, you love government, you know, they, they had a mock election in a class, great. There's a, Pinellas County has a youth council advisory board. You know, what, how wonderful would it be for them to, to, to hop on board and jump into that? So these small moments and these small segments add up to bigger picture things a little bit later, especially in my junior and my senior year in, in terms of um, being useful on an application. Don't take someone else's prescription, <laughs> all right? Um, I say that with a little bit of tongue in cheek, and, and I mean it because I love how fabulously close you are as families, but I will say that each one of you are parents to very unique individual students. And so I don't envy you because there is too much information. I very much appreciate the amount of articles that are sent my way, but I can't take in all of the articles or all of the information, it's too much. So what I'm saying by do not take someone else's prescription is, and use me as a resource, right? Work with us, because I might have said something, even if you have twins, I might have prescribed or, or created a design or plan or suggested some colleges or universities or asked you to consider some things that was specifically designed for one twin and not the other one. So in that sense, um, um, there are generalities, and I try to use the generalities, but go directly to the source. Because for every argument, there's a counter argument. You know, for example, I've heard, ah, I mean, I, I have to start taking my, my, my SATs in, in my freshman year. I have to start practicing. No, please don't. <laughs> You're not ready for the material just yet. And if you, if, you, if you want eventually to consider University of Pennsylvania, they require all of your testing, including the ninth grade one where you weren't quite ready and you thought it was just going to be practice. Right? So that's what I mean by allow me, allow my office to be a resource for you, but let's try to stay, stay specifically with uh, um, a couple more specifics instead of some generalities. Don't get sticker shock. <laughs> when I'm speaking to my students, that's exactly what I mean. But um, I'm going to use that word because it's a very practical, realistic um, um, piece of advice for you to have would be um, become aware of the cost of attending college or, uh, college or university now. And that's a very real um, um, percentage. Tuition has increased for the University of uh, Florida. So if I have any Gators in the room, my sister's a Gator, so I, I, I feel connected to the family. The Gator Nation is a very strong nation, I understand. But if you went through this process, it's changed. You know, I'm thinking of her, her, her uh, college freshman, sophomore. Hey, that's sophomore. <laughs> um, um, it's from the time that, that even if you have a son or a daughter that has just graduated, the US, UF application process and their tuition and fees has changed. 
all right? So what I'm encouraging you to do right now, even as a parent of a middle schooler, as a, even as a parent of, of, a, of, a, of a lower schooler um, um, student, to, to, to just become aware. So one of the biggest shifts in, the, in higher ed right now is for it, a lot of their scholarships to be need-based scholarships. Right? And how do you find out if I am going to be, um, if they would consider me as being eligible for need-based scholarships? Every single one of, um, college, every single college or university in the United States has to have a net price calculator somewhere on their website. It's required by law. So the net price calculator is a calculator. You plug in your specific information, it should, you know, what you should get in return is an estimated financial aid package. So get in there, plug in some numbers, you know, um, and, and kind of get an idea of, hypothetically speaking, if I were to apply right now, what would I receive? You know, so I would say it's an important part of the, the financial planning piece. It's also an important piece of that. Um, I know that many families invest in the Florida um, uh, prepaid. It's a fantastic option. Um, I often find families where, where the, the son or the daughter now is telling me, I want to go out of state. How does that transfer? <laughs> Right? So in that sense, be prepared for both options. Not your mama's UF, not your UF, not my UF. It's not the UF of the class of 2014 either. Um, in fact, last year in the middle of the process, they changed the process on me and, and came up with a new option. So for example, um, I went to the University of Florida's uh, luncheon the other day and um, they were talking about their rise in applications. Um, a full month before the application deadline, they had over 2,000 applications to begin considering. So when I say not your mama's UF, I would say this, is there, there's, the, there's the average way to be accepted to UF in, in the fall. There's now the summer, you can be admitted in the summer, a summer admit. There's something called Innovation Academy, <laughs> where you can be admitted to the University of Florida to take classes in the spring and in the summer, never in the fall, and you get to minor in innovation. Yes, welcome. Exactly. Right, <laughs> welcome, welcome to my exactly. Um, and so I'm here to help you guide that, guide you through um, that 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 process. There is also, um, did you know that you can take, you can graduate from the University of Florida by, while taking classes strictly online. They now offer nine degrees online. And don't worry, they give you a tuition discount for having your son or your daughter live in your house while they go to college, 25%. Um, but last year, last year they also introduced, so I've talked about three different ways to the University of Florida. Last year, they sprang a fourth one on me. It's called PACE, Pathway Access to College Enrollment. You can take two years of uh, classes online and then be guaranteed two years of, of campus enrollment. Some of you are looking at me going, so I don't want this to happen to you in, in, in later, right? So that's why I'm just saying like, investigate. The schools, check out, you start with your own, your own alma mater. It's lots of fun <laughs> to say, wow, how has it changed or how has it remained the same? And what, what's the profile of the student in which they're accepting right now? So I say this to just encourage you to investigate kind of what's the landscape, what are the options out there? Online learning is a huge um, um, uh, trend right now in colleges and universities. They're offering kind of flexible learning. And so that's something that you will find a lot of our programs or a lot of our, our, our college partners will do nowadays. Our students are over-programmed. <laughs> and you know that because you drive them to, the, to, <laughs> to these programs, right? If it's not sincere, it will not translate. Meaning that um, they can be very dedicated to soccer and it can take hours upon hours upon hours of their life. Um, and then all of a sudden decide, you know what, I don't want to play Division Two, Three, or Division One soccer in college and then they come to me with kind of like the well how do I make sense of the fact that it's taking so much of my time okay so my thought would be it's for the love of the game because then I can begin to start to, um, the conversation with them about what have you learned from being involved in in soccer so long you know what have you learned from being from 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 um, singing in the chorus or taking music you know for many years you know at first many of them start off by saying because mom and dad made me do it. I said, yes, but there's a reason why you continue to play piano or violin or really love music. Maybe it soothes you. There's a passion, there's an interest that comes along, and if they can promote that, that love, then that's the reason to continue to do it.
4,000, not 40. <laughs> and I mean, what I mean by this is that there are 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States, not just the 40 that you see on US News and World Top, um, um, top Report, or, you know, like, yes, the, the, the newspapers want to take a headline and say, oh my gosh, it's so hard to get into colleges. Students are applying to 25 colleges. Our students apply to eight on average. <laughs> if they're applying to 25, please tell them to come see me, <laughs> right? But my point would be is that i like you to investigate all of them or as many of them as you can imagine. So for example, Eckerd, Eckerd College, right down the street, has one of the top ranked marine science programs in the nation. They come from Maine, they come from California, they come from Alaska to go to Eckerd. <laughs> right? And so I say that to say, to, to just, um, we encourage discovery. There are a number of different ways to build your college list, if you will. Because, for example, I'm, I'm throwing some names out there, not to discredit any of these schools, but if, if, if we get Johnny in to Duke by the skin of his chinny chin chin, and he spends his entire four years feeling like, oh, I have to go to extra help, and I have to go to, I have to, I have to focus on surviving, are they thriving in that environment? So there are a couple ways that you can explore the list. Colleges that change lives. That's one college, that's one list, if you will, that these schools partner together to talk about focusing on a transformative experience. There are a bunch of schools that really want to make sure that you're, you're, they're focused on the social, emotional health and growth of your student. And so I use that as just one of the examples. U.S. News and World Report. <laughs> As an admissions officer, I knew that they came out. We were addicted to them. We were really proud to tell you we're the number one program in this or the number seven program in that. Use it with purpose. Use it to get ideas. So I encourage you to go explore. Yes, take your little ones and invade that college campus <laughs> because your college counselor said you can. Turn every family vacation into a mini college tour. And what I mean by that is have lunch on campus in the student union, in the midst of college students. Take a walk around campus. You don't have to go on that official college tour. You might be a little too young um, for, for that right now, but that exposure, you expect them to go to college, yes, <laughs> right? So do they know that you expect them to go to college, <laughs> right? Um, so that's another piece of it. So you can kind of give them a subliminal message by encouraging them to explore. So by the time they've come to visit me, they're like, yeah, I've, I've seen a couple. We saw a really weird, wacky one. You know, we were passing through Vermont and we stopped at, a, at you know, Maritime Academy. It was interesting. I don't like the water. You know, like, um, but my point would be is that it's never too early to start exploring. I say okay, but for the purpose of asking them why questions. What, for example, try out a smaller liberal arts college or campus. You know, try NYU. Plop them in the middle of the city and say, hey, what do you think? And they might say, I don't like the fact that cars are buzzing through my college campus. I really want birds and trees. Um, if you ask a senior what is the most stressful part about the application process, besides the fear of and the anxiety of getting in, it's really the essay. What should I, what should, I don't even know where to begin. As an admissions officer, I should say that it was my favorite part of the essay. You know, it's, some, it's like talking about someone all the time and then finally getting an opportunity to hand that person the mic. It was my favorite part. I read the transcript, I read the recommendations, but I saved the essay until the end. And when I flipped over to this side of the desk, I immediately started to tell all of my admissions friends, please read the essay two or three or four or five more times because they spent a lot of time on this essay. Really the anxiety is this. For many of them, they've never had or took, taken the moment to reflect on why do they do the things that they do? Who are they? For example, some of the essays might say, tell me, about where you're, tell me about where you're from. What does it mean to be a Johnson, a Craig, a Smith? Uh, what does it mean to be um, a part of your family? They've never stopped to reflect on it, perhaps. And all of a sudden, they have to do it. And it has to be perfect. And it has to be in 500 words or less. <laughs> right? You all, you would get kind of anxious too, right? So, so there are questions in the why. In the why, encourage I statements. I really enjoyed this. I, I wasn't sure that I enjoyed this as much. And then to follow up with the why. Well, what, 
what do you love about this teacher's class? You know, maybe they can reflect on the way in which they learn. You know what, mom? I really love it when I can learn by, by doing and the project was really awesome. So cool, you've learned something about their learning style that they can then reflect upon. And so when, when Drexel or Northeastern says, why are you applying to Drexel or Northeastern? They can say, your co-op programs in which I receive credit for, for on-the-job on -job experience really supports my learning style that in an environment that I really thrive. Um, this this second point point. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I used to work at MIT and and at or at any admissions office, University of Virginia, Colgate. Every, every I, I see them getting ready to approach me as an admissions officer. They they fix their hair, you know, they've got their tie on and they look absolutely adorable. And they come up to me and they say, Hi, I'm Tiffany and I'm from and you know, and, and they've got their not one student in my entire admissions career came up to me and said, hi, I'm Tiffany, and I'm slightly lazy in class sometimes, but I'm working on it, you know? <laughs> right? It's the idea of perfection, right? You want them to be perfect. I get it. <laughs> you want them to appear perfect on paper. And then all of a sudden, the colleges will ask you, talk about a time you failed. And how did you respond to that failure? And my students come in there like, but I've never failed. <laughs> OK. So what college professors really want to know, are they resilient? If I nudge you a little bit, are you going to pop up and try a different route? You know, that idea of innovation. Right, that idea of oh, you know what this path didn't work, but I'm going to try another route. That I, I know where to get support when I need it. Right. So. I know it's hard, but watch them and help them maybe redirect, try something else. It's okay to stumble because it's in the getting up that really, really, really matters. My sister is a kindergarten teacher and she's like, why is it important? You know, and I realized that because as an admissions officer, that was the number one question that I had. It wasn't what you were doing, it was the why you were doing it. So for example, I might have at MIT, I might have had the, the uh, biology lab researcher, right, who spent the entire summer researching the biology lab. Or I had the gamer, who spent the entire summer playing a video game, okay? Which one was more, which, which one was preferable for, for the admissions committee? It was behind, it was the, it, it, they were the whys behind it, biology researcher, followed mom and dad to work every day for the summer, used their lab because they were researchers in the lab and he couldn't explain his research project very well because maybe he didn't do his research project himself. <laughs> um, so that didn't fare as well. The video gamer, right? Loved video games so much. He, he's always looking, he's always writing um, codes, they call them like cheat codes, if you will. He's always writing new codes to kind of get around the system. He loves video gaming so much that he organized a video game tournament and dedicated the money to cancer research. I'm infusing that idea that there is this concept of colleges, there are, there are concepts of, of careers or maybe, you know, Doc McStuffins. Doc, you know, she, uh, Kendall wants to be Doc McStuffins. She went, you know, and so I'm like, she's a vet. Oh yeah, okay. She, she can't necessarily pronounce it, but, you know, um, um, but nonetheless, you know, oh, well, they go to school. Yeah. I said, do you like school? Yes. And they go to school for quite some time. She's like, yeah, but I would do it if I can help stuff animals. I was like, oh, okay. You know, it's a neat conversation. So I welcome you there. It's never too early to infuse that conversation in there. Um, middle school is so full of change, isn't it? Um, and there are certain things that you can do at middle school to set the foundations and the parameters for an awesome experience for high school. For example, um, boundaries and unplugging. They need to unplug. So at MIT, before I left, we, we, we were studying um, the, the um, how do we make a more efficient application? Is the application truly capturing the things that would make you successful as an MIT student? And so they, first they, they, they performed their research in the quantitative research. They, they crunched all of the numbers that they could. 
Then they went into the actual applications and actual graduates, and they went into or their qualities that these graduates had that we could use to predict a successful student coming in on the front end. The number one predictor that they found at the time that, that I departed the office, the number of hours of sleep a high school student was receiving. In my office just this week, I had a senior come in who said, I have four hours of sleep. And I'm thinking, he got four hours of sleep right now, and he would like to pursue Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Stanford. Oh my gosh. So helping them, middle school parents, helping them understand that there's a, there's a way of time management, there's a way of structure, that if you are producing something with four hours of sleep, you have not produced your best work. So much of communication happens is, is nonverbal, right? So are they missing the cues to be able to connect with their peers, with their teachers, or with the admissions officer as they sit down for that interview, okay? So in terms of middle school and that age, sleep, unplugging, um, kind of healthy guidelines on how to express themselves. They're so anxious to express themselves, right? And then last but not least, that passion project. Right? Eighth grade, you get a fantastic passion project. And so I asked Mr. Davis for, that pas for a list of the passion projects. And he's saying, why do you want them? I'm saying, because wouldn't it be great if the student pursued that passion project? And they were really interested in that one assignment. And that led them on another path of exploration to something in ninth grade and maybe in 10th grade. Upper school parents, I know that you want it to all come together. They're in upper school now, everything's counts, and it's gonna be neat, and it's gonna be perfect, and they're going to be that kind of kid, and things of that nature, when in all honesty, it looks like this. <laughs> okay, okay. It, it's okay to explore. It's okay to, to, to take the moments, initial moments in high school to explore a little bit more, and then hone it in to be a little bit more specific in your junior and your senior year. Upper school parents, I just want you to know that I do address every class throughout the year, but freshman night um, in January, fresh, uh, sophomore night um, in, in February, um, I've met with my juniors, but I meet again with specifically the junior students in February. Uh, I told you I use Twitter and, and Instagram. If you do too, um, please feel free to follow us. Um, we post things like Money Matters on, on, Monday, uh, on Mondays or, or post events and, or tips that we have um, or events that we have um, happening on, in our college center. I leave you with this thought <laughs> um, because I believe it. It's what keeps me going every day. The message that you hear from me is to prep. I think, that, I think that every student should, be, um, should pursue some option for test prep. And so within Shorecrest or within um, companies, for example, Shorecrest offers several free options for test prep. You know, so there's a test prepping option for any family. So whether it is they, they, they're fine, it's kind of like getting a personal trainer, <laughs> right? So in that sense, there are so many different programs, whichever program works for you. So there are free options. Um, ePrep is a free online resource for our, our, for our families. Um, Kaplan partners with our school only to facilitate a couple of, so they get used to that general testing experience. So for example, October 16th, ne um, next Friday, they'll come in and they'll administer a mock ACT so that our students can get used to testing in an unfamiliar atmosphere or, or with um, facilitators. So in the sense of, is it worth it? You know, so there are also a number of private tutors that work very closely with Shorecrest families and have for quite some time. I say that it's important that you introduce test prepping into the conversation because there's an art to taking the test. There's a difference between the SAT and the ACT, for example. And so some of these companies or um, avenues really help you understand, there, for example, there's a tip in saying, all right, if you're a slower reader, maybe you should read the questions and then return to read the passage, right? So you can pick out the questions, the, the answers that you're specifically looking for. You can save some time and you can move on. And so in that sense, those um, sorts of tips can be incredibly helpful in terms of timing, your timeline of like, oh, he's a sophomore, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, so there are a couple of, most of our students will start to, to sit, truly sit for a standardized test that, that matters, that counts for them um, in the spring of their junior year. 
But if you couple on the, the junior year, it's kind of a little intense. They're taking perhaps um, a, a strenuous academic course load. Um, they are perhaps maybe a fall athlete and they have a couple of different things happening at the same time. They may be saying like, oh, mom and dad, I don't have time to actually prep. So it's the idea of taking um, taking an experience and kind of cutting it down and lengthening the, the, the test prep process. Some families get started in the summer between their junior, and their sophomore and their, their junior year because they're saying we don't have enough time to pack it in in the fall before they start to really take the test in January and, and in the spring. I love the program in the sense that it gives you, at a younger age, an opportunity to explore some maybe acad uh, um, academic um, supplemental experiences that might really help you start with one or two paths or, or, or programs that might help you identify where else you should go with your, with your, with your son or your daughter. Thank you, Tiffany. You're very welcome. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome.